Hello everyone! We are unfortunately still in the fourth year of the Clown Decade now, not third anymore. Hey, we're getting through it. And as the prophecy foretold, things are only going to get worse before they get better. And we all knew at this point that state schools in the UK run by local councils and even more directly by the national curriculum in the government had been taken over by the woke mind virus. It's no surprise there, even if you go on BBC Bite Size, there's a lot of wokery in there. And of course, when I say woke, I mean postmodern neo Marxist ideas being pushed onto kids. Examples of which we may as well get into soon, because even the anti woke, I guess we can say, headmistress, Catherine Burblesing, is arguing that the woke mind virus is making its way into private schools. So, woke attacks on the privileged will ruin private schools, says former Tsar. And it is in her opinion that the pupils have too much control over what they actually learn, which, when I went to school, kids basically had no choice, apart from choosing what subjects they want. Elite private schools are being hollowed out by woke culture, the former social mobility Tsar has claimed. Catherine Burble Singh, described as the country's strictest head teacher, said that Britain's public schools were threatened by incessant attacks on the privileged. The former chairwoman of the Social Mobility Commission warned that schools had lost their traditional sense of duty towards the less fortunate. Burble Singh also said that free charging schools had been seduced by child centred learning, creativity, and independence, and had handed authority to pupils. Now, when I think back to the good old days when I was at a public school, handing the <laughs> handing authority to pupils would have definitely been a bad idea because the people who would have gone out of their way to take that authority will have been the worst type of people and would not have done learning either by choice or via incompetence. In an essay for a new edition of the book titled The State of Independence, she writes, Recently the private schools, and in particular some of the more established public schools, remind me of the iceberg that has melted over time. Weakened by their misplaced love of child-centred learning and rejection of adult authority over decades. In such a fragile state, when the woke brigade comes searching, these schools flip right over, suddenly and without warning, bowing to the incessant cry against the privilege. Once upon a time, public schools were the bastions of traditionalism, setting the standard for the rest of us. The richer in society used to have a sense of duty towards those who were less fortunate, and these schools made it their raison d'etre to inspire young men and women to serve others. Many graduates from these schools would seek careers that would allow them to give back and live out their duty. And of course, here is our example of wokery. Leading schools that have attracted attention include St Paul's Girls' School in West London, whose head girl is now known as Head of School. The American school in London was downgraded by Ofsted for overly focusing on social justice issues and reportedly teaching critical race theory, which, in my stance, thank God Ofsted are doing something useful. Eaton appointed a director of inclusion education, encouraging Black Lives Matter waistcoats, and decolonised its curriculum. Which, I think that really is the nastiest language play I have seen in some time, decolonising a curriculum. If you are teaching an English or British curriculum, and decolonising it means taking out the British parts of the curriculum, that is doing the opposite of decolonising it, that is colonising it. And yet, this is where we are up to in the culture wars. Again, we're in the clown decade, and we're on the losing side. Anyway, not too long after this article was written, the Times came out with another article from an anonymous source, presumably to protect their identity, their job, and their livelihood. What I know about woke schools, the leading head teacher, Catherine Burblesing, has said the private sector is thrall to ideology. And one parent responds. And really, we do talk about the wokeness here. That is really what it's focusing on, where the problem is, is that things have become so weak that something as silly and weakly cohesive as woke ideology can take over schools that are supposed to be the bastions of tradition. That is actually the real story behind all this. This whole woke stuff is just, this is what has happened to take over. But to be fair, it would make for very funny reading if it wasn't all so real. How are your homelessness workshops going? I asked my 15 year old son recently after he said he'd sign up for an exciting new project, touted in his school's weekly email. I've stopped going, he said. There was loads of stuff on preconceptions of homeless people that were kind of obvious. And anyway, I had to go to the library as I had eight pieces of homework this week. A snapshot I know, but as a private school parent, this rather sums up my response to an essay by Catherine Burblesing the superhead and former chairwoman of the Social Mobility Commission, saying that elite private schools have become obsessed with embracing woke issues and pupil-centric learning. Burbel Singh's view is that private schools are empowering pupils to assuage the guilt they feel for their privilege by embracing woke campaigns on topics such as race, gender and sexuality, and this then gives them a green pass to feeling like a good person. The implication is that pupils may learn to be people who are very vocal on Twitter, 
but will be less likely to choose a career or vocation that would involve them giving back in any meaningful way. And that nicely sums up what is happening. Schools aren't teaching kids to aspire. Schools aren't really teaching kids to actually better themselves. These schools are teaching kids that having any sort of prejudice is grounds for them to completely change their worldview because any negative prejudice is apparently what creates a world that is full of racism, sexism, whateverisms. When really I've always been of the opinion that if you have prejudices, that's not really a problem. The problem is when you act upon them, i.e. when you discriminate against people or treat people poorly because of your own preconceived notions. I.e. when you meet someone, say a homeless person, and you have a lot of prejudices about them, that's fine. What won't be fine is if you then treat them like, a, say, they're subhuman, or that they deserve, as I saw in a recent video on Twitter, for poo to be smeared in their face. Yes, that is something I saw in San Francisco on Twitter. But instead, if you just treat them as any other person, say hello, be polite, give them their due diligence, all that, then I don't have a problem with that. The problem is, is that a lot of schools are teaching kids that because they happen to be born lucky, then that means they have to feel some sort of original sin guilt for being born lucky, which is only going to make them shrink, which is really what they should be doing is saying, look, you're really lucky to be born into this family, this wealth, this privilege, if you want to go with that word. Do your work, get your qualifications, become something greater than yourself that will help the rest of your country or humanity if you want to go that far. And in turn, you will leave behind a better planet than the one you found. However, as being pointed out by this parent, we seem to be teaching our kids to leave behind a worse planet for themselves and lifting up absolutely anyone that is not a straight white male. So yes, my son's top London day school offers workshops on homelessness. Yes, they've had numerous lectures about diversity, studied unconscious bias, and the difference between sexuality and gender, and yes, the books on his English reading list are refreshingly more diverse than mine were 30 years ago, but right now the true focus of his school experience is getting through mountains of Latin and chemistry homework and feeling pressured by teachers to achieve success in his GCSEs. When it comes to pupil-centric learning, he would say the only thing he gets to choose is whether he does his two hours of homework a day in the library or at home. Someone did post a news story about Burbal Singh's views on our parents' WhatsApp group yesterday. I'm all for more lectures on these topics, she said, quickly followed by, by the way, can anyone recommend a good GCSE French tutor? The WhatsApp group moved on to more pressing matters, academic results. So the point from this particular parent and apparently other parents is that while some parents might be on the off chance starting a conversation with, oh, I like the idea of my kids be becoming moral vessels, I guess we can call them. The heart of every parent and pupil inevitably goes to, okay, but how do I actually do better with my qualifications and results? Extracurricular activities, they really should be more fun than just being lectured at. Ones at my school, at the very least, included the obvious sports, football, rugby, cricket in the summer. Some people did drama and other people who were a bit less creative did stage crew to help with the drama. We had a couple of choirs as well. There was an engineering club. There was chess as well, I believe. All this stuff is still partly for an education and partly to grow a pupil's confidence and their abilities and things like this. Whereas if you're just being lectured at for an hour, doing a homelessness workshop that this kid doesn't want to do anymore because all it goes on to is this wokery nonsense, then of course they're not going to be interested. It's not going to improve their abilities in any way other than moulding their minds so that they will be completely accepted into a HR department. I really should stop throwing a HR department under the rug. I mean, my sister's head of one and they absolutely hate this stuff as well. In West London, at another mixed private school that was also named in the Everyone's Invited scandal, which was a website where schoolgirls could describe and say how they had been sexually abused at school. A lot of top private schools were included in that. One parent does feel that there is too much wokery now. She doesn't agree with Burble Singh that it might make her son vocal on Twitter in later life instead of going out to do good in the world. She's more concerned that it is unfair on him right now. There is a feeling in the school now that the boys are always in the wrong while the girls can do no wrong, she says. The girls now know that all you have to do is go to a teacher and say that boy makes me feel scared and that boy is in trouble. The result, says another parent, is that the boys are so fed up they just switch off. They're just getting on with being teenage boys. Another parent of a 17-year-old daughter questions whether the classes have even made a difference, citing that only recently a group of A-level students were caught swapping topless photos of a female student. The irony is that no one was suspended, so what's the point of all these classes about consent? 
yeah, so that is a, another problem with the woke mind virus. It thinks, oh, we'll just tell all these people how to think and it'll completely change them as a person. That only works in a certain amount of people. It doesn't affect the vast majority. So you might then think, well, what's the point? Well, the point is, is there's a lot of 16-year-old boys are just not going to listen to this stuff because of people like Andrew Tate. Because in their head, they're going, wow, these classes are really boring and everything they're saying isn't making sense. And then someone like Andrew Tate comes along and says, hey, these classes don't make any sense. You should listen to me instead because I've just made sense to you. And they go, oh, OK. Whereas if these classes weren't being done in the first place, none of this could have happened anyway. So it's actually having a much bigger kickback than they might want. And so as a result for boys, as you can see, three things are happening. Either the boys are just ignoring it all and getting on with their lives, but have a feeling they're on a back foot because, quite frankly, in the education system, they have the back foot. They are getting in trouble with annoying girls because girls realise that there are incentives for them to go to a teacher and basically just lie to them, saying that a boy is making them feel scared, whatever that means. And due to all this training and these procedures, the teachers just have to get that boy in trouble for scaring a girl. And finally, as I say, uh, boys go to Andrew Tate instead because he makes more sense to them. So there seems to be absolutely no positive outcomes. And then when the boys are swapping topless photos, as we can see here, no one's suspended, no one's in trouble. What is the point of these classes if you're not going to punish these boys who did wrong? Anyway, it's also important to point out at this point that the main way that kids actually come into contact with uh, critical race theory and other woke subjects is actually through TikTok and social media. The issue is is that when they get to school and the schools are teaching them this as well and reinforcing that perspective, that is where you can end up having issues and get them into these ideologies that end up with stories like this. Non-binary Jesus Christ is superstar. A landmark musical has been resurrected for the 21st century with a non-binary actor taking the role of Jesus and Judas is Cariot being played by a woman? Jesus Christ Superstar has been prompting controversy and filling theatre since it was written by Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber and Sir Tim Rice more than half a century ago. Now students from the Edinburgh University Savoy Opera Group will launch the world's first gender-neutral production of the rock opera today. Now with things like this, I really don't have that much of an issue. Theatre groups can do what they want. They can make any sort of art they want. I don't really care. The issue comes in is that they then start using things like this as a bit of a skin suit. The other example I can think of off the top of my head is that I, Joan play at the Globe Theatre where they made Joan of Arc a non-binary person as well. And they started that show with a monologue saying trans people are sacred or something like that. Basically, they have so little spirituality in their lives, they have to make their entire identity their spirituality. Otherwise, they just feel like empty shells. And this is the main problem I have. These people have so little identity or spirituality that they need to take other great stories and crowbar their own agendas into them. Now, I've not actually seen Jesus Christ Superstar, but what, from what I understand of it, it is actually just The Passion of the Christ, the musical which a lot of people may see as blasphemous, but from what I understand about it, it's not really that bad. But what we're doing now is basically turning all the characters into women, and Jesus is going to be non-binary. And the reasoning behind it is what gets to me. Lou Foreman, the creative producer, said the production had adopted gender-blind casting to reinvent the story of Jesus' final days for a modern audience. Even though the whole point is that it's supposed to be timeless, Jesus is remembered as being a man, but who are we to decide, he said. None of us were around 2,000 years ago. It's the same story and songs, but the audience will view it from a different perspective. Which is, to me, hilarious, because if you are trying to come from a gender-blind casting perspective, then really the perspective shouldn't change from these people. This is part of the problem with gender ideology, by the way. They keep trying to say and push for years that there's barely any difference between men and women. In fact, there's so little difference that you can just say you're a woman if you have a penis and, hey presto, you're a woman. And yet in the adaption, which has been approved and licensed by Lloyd Webber, Rosa Stevenson, who uses the pronouns they then will play Jesus, while the Twelve Apostles will be portrayed by female or non-binary performers. In other words, the creative producer somehow adopted a gender-blind casting policy and didn't manage to hire a single man out of 12 possible roles. I simply do not believe that this was gender-blind casting. This story just gets better and better, by the way. Lloyd Webber licensing granted permission for the production, but insisted that the lyrics and pronouns must not be changed. It means that Mary Magdalene, played by Sophia Priccolo, will sing I don't know how to love him about Jesus rather than I don't know how to love them. 
interesting. So all this nonsense about we're bringing a new perspective to all this, blah, blah, blah. Well, you still have to refer to even the women who are playing apostles as hymns. You're still referring to them as males, so I, I guess when we hear more about this story, we will have a better understanding of how this new perspective comes into play, because what's the point of doing all this if you can't even change the script to fit your gender ideology? Anyway, if you think all oh, that's bad enough, we actually finally get to the real world, and what all this wokeness does from instilling it when they're young is turn our country into an Orwellian nightmare. And as I say, things are only going to get worse in the coming decade before they get better. And this is an example of things getting worse. Now, on the face of it, this doesn't seem like a terrible thing. Black Boy Lane in Tottenham renamed over racial connotations. And as you can see, it's been renamed to La Rose Lane. And as I say on the face of it, oh, something that has poor racial connotations, yes, I would be fine if that's renamed, and if the local community wanted it. As well, writes in 1984, it is every road sign that has been renamed. Renaming one or two for whatever reason, because the bottom-up way of the community deciding that they want a name change somewhere is absolutely fine. However, I am ridiculously politically engaged. I know that Sadiq Khan has been pushing for diversity and inclusive street names and statue names and plaques everywhere, so I'm suspecting that there's some foul play going on here. A street in North London has been renamed due to concerns about racial connotations of its former name. Previously known as Black Boy Lane, the Tottenham Road is now called La Rose Lane after the black poet, publisher and activist John La Rose. That's another thing that is annoying me, all these renaming things have to be for political activists because everything has to be political these days. His grandson, Ronaldo LaRose, described the name change as a beautiful thing. Others have criticised it for being performative to display of virtuousness and a futile jester. Mr LaRose, who is from the area, told BBC Radio London, growing up I didn't know the origins of Black Boy Lane, why or when it was called that, by who or what it is based on. But one thing we do know for sure, LaRose Lane is named after John LaRose, and you can see the tangible work he has done for the community now. So we're going to quickly skip over the fact that the BBC have just skipped on the information of why it's called Black Boy Lane. They go straight into saying who Mr. LaRose was. Mr. LaRose was a poet and social activist from Trinidad. He arrived in Britain in 1961 and in 1966 founded New Beacon Books in Finsbury Park, described as the first Caribbean publishing house, bookshop and international book service in the UK. Mr. LaRose was an advocate for Caribbean artists, children and workers. Harringley Council said that in 1975, after a black schoolboy was assaulted by the police in the borough, Mr. LaRose and concerned parents founded the Black Parents Movement to combat what they described as the brutalisation and criminalisation of young black people. The movement became one of the most powerful cultural and political movements organised by black people in Britain, the council said. Well, of course the council are going to be pushing for claims like that. They just spent a ridiculous amount of money on what is essentially just changing a sign. And from the sounds of his story, he seems like a perfectly good man. And I have no doubt in my mind that his movement did a lot of good for the community. That's absolutely fine. And if the street locals wanted the name change to that, then I don't see a problem. I keep saying that for a particular reason. So what do the supporters say? Professor Gus John, an academic and equality and human rights campaigner, helped set up new beacon books with Mr. LaRose, who was also a close friend. He said, I thought it was about time. For us, as black people, the very notion of Black Boy Lane, when we remember the era of enslavement, was more or less that we were mascots to the rich and wealthy, and has connotations for us in how we came to be here at all. Hilarious when most black people who came to Britain were actually free. In this day and age, with a growing African population in this country and more and more African heritage people born here, it seems completely backwards and archaic to have a road called Black Boy Lane. So there you go. The BBC found one supporter who was a black academic who assumes Black Boy Lane has slavery connotations. And the BBC still don't tell us where Black Boy Lane actually came from. So well, how did the name change come about? Well, Harringley Council began a consultation following the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2020. Great, thanks America. The council said many local people are concerned about the racial connotations of the name and the impact it continued use has on black people in Haringey, but admitted that a significant number of residents of the street objected to the plans. Oh, hello. The local authority said the name change was part of a wider ranging review into the history of street names in the borough. Several buildings and streets in London with names linked to the transatlantic slave trade 
have been renamed in recent years, and the BBC still refused to say the origin of this name. So finally, what do the critics say? The campaign group Save Our Statue said it was a futile gesture and criticised the use of public money spent on it. Founder Robert Pohl said, The move is representative of the current impulses to hunt out racism at a fence where there is none as a performative display of virtuousness. All fair things to say, but I do like how somehow the BBC find a local resident to find supporters for it, they then have the council admit that they're a local opposition to the name change, and then when it comes to critics, it's just a Twitter account, basically. Well, I say it's just a Twitter account, that really is undermining Save Our Statues. They do very good work, and they are a direct activist group against this sort of nonsense. Please show your support to them on Twitter or any other way you can find. But really, I'm pointing out how this BBC article is horrible at describing what is actually going on here. And with all that, a lot of reasoning for changing the name is the origin of Black Boy Lane. We need to know where it came from, and the BBC doesn't even bother saying in this article. Though in another, much less viewed article, the BBC decide that they're actually going to say where the origin of Black Boy Lane came from. Black Boy Lane is thought to have been named after a pub in the late 17th century. That really wasn't that difficult. Unfortunately, when you've got a big article saying, hey, all these people are saying that there's racist connotations to it, having a line in it with facts saying, actually, there probably isn't that many racial connotations to it really does undermine what the BBC is trying to push there. Now, throughout this time, I've been saying a lot of money has been put into this, and there was local opposition to this that even the council had to admit. But you're probably wondering where I'm getting all this information from. Thankfully, Emily Carver of The Telegraph has done the handiwork for us, so we're just going to go through some information here. After more than two years of reviews, deliberations, and three consultations, a residential street sign has been removed, and a new one put in its place. No longer will Black Boy Lane be tarnished by what Harrogate Council calls the name's racist connotations. It will now be called La Rose Lane after the black activist, publisher, poet and essayist. Total cost of this process, which I assume includes the cost of replacing the physical signs, the hours spent on the consultation process, the two in-person and one online engagement sessions that managed a total of one attendee between them who opposed the change, and the proposed £300 compensation to each household and business on the street is estimated at an eye-watering £180,000. I absolutely love how a free £300 still wasn't enough to get some people on side for what is essentially just changing your street address. I'm not being funny, I would take £300 to rename my road. Of course, the idea to do away with Black Boy Lane wasn't solely the brainchild of a few left-wing councillors. Now, in the words of the council, the catalyst for the reviews was the establishment of the Mayor of London sinister sounding Commission of Diversity in the Public Realm, which was naturally prompted by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the subsequent rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Once again, thank you, America. The council papers themselves warned that not going ahead with the renaming at this point would not capitalise on the momentum created by the Black Lives Matter movement, prompting questions of if not now, then when. In other words, the council have found mush and they keep pushing. The irony is, is that so few of those actually living on the street are even interested in the consultation of the 36 residents or business owners on Black Boy Lane who responded to the consultation. The overwhelming majority, 81%, were against the change, including all three of the Black African and Caribbean respondents. This is where I have a massive issue with this. Because not only was it a completely unrelated to Britain event happening in America, that started Sadiq Khan and Black Lives Matter pushing consultations and name changes and commissions like this. But then when it actually comes to renaming anything, they are overwhelmingly unpopular. And even when the people who need to be consulted on this, it turns out that 100% in this case of the African or Caribbean respondents were against it. The people that this name change was supposedly for are actively against it. One resident replied, I do not approve of the name change. As a black woman, I find nothing offensive about Black Boy Lane. I am not ashamed of the word black. I'm proud of it. I'd rather Harringay Council spent its time and money addressing the real issues in our borough, such as the antisocial behaviour, knife crime, and the state of the public realm. Another noted, we do not have a definitive answer regarding the origins of the name of our road, other than it was either the maternal nickname of King Charles II, or a Victorian name 
for a chimney sweep, which I was always led to believe. Neither of which has racist connotations, therefore it seems like an unnecessary and expensive move, especially during a pandemic, when money could be better spent elsewhere. Both true, and if I were to guess, given that it was a 17th century pub, I would guess the King Charles II one. However, there is every chance it could have been renamed in the Victorian period for a Victorian chimney sweep. And of course, this all comes at the same time when the Harrogate local newspaper, the Harrogate Community Press, put out this article. Council Housing Services investigated over high numbers of severe mould and damp cases. Housing Ombudsman will find out whether repeated failures indicate systematic problem at the Civic Centre, reports Simon Allen, local democracy reporter. Just to make that plainly clear to you, while Harrogate Council was being investigated due to severe mould and damp cases, which has been causing many issues and even a few deaths in young children. Instead of spending the 200000 on improving the conditions in their council houses, they decided instead just to rename a street that absolutely nobody on the street, well not nobody, that the vast majority of the street did not want and they did it in service of black people and absolutely none of the black people on the street wanted it. This is a perfect example to bring us back to the original title of this video. This is the problem that Catherine Burblesing pointed out. Instead of these public school kids doing anything useful, going into politics and doing good with their lives and trying to find and implement good policy, they will instead be doing things that make them feel better about themselves, like renaming a street that basically nobody wanted renamed who lived on the street, and ignoring real issues that are causing serious harm, like the severe mould and damp cases in their councils. And the thing is, the dedicated Zoomers and Millennials who were all for this nonsense are unfortunately also the ones perpetuating the problem even further. This is how one particular Tottenham resident decided to report the story on TikTok. What's going on people? As of the 23rd of January, Black Boy Lane will be renamed to LaRose Lane. Here's that story. So, so far it all seems fine, it's just been nothing but facts. Uh, let's see where these facts lead him. In the 1619 survey, the road name didn't exist. The street appears to have got its name from the nearby Black Boy pub. Good work, so we know the row name came after the pub existed, so odds are, yes, that is where Black Boy Lane came from, it came from Black Boy Pub. The pub can be traced back to the late 17th century. Although the origin of the pub's name is not clear, during the 20th century the pub's sign depicted a racially caricatured image of a black person until it was replaced in the 1980s as a result of pressure from local residents. Uh, I'd like to see what the old sign looked so that I can judge for myself to see how caricaturish it was but you know for, for the for the sake of argument i will go off his word yes it probably was a racial caricature and yes i can imagine that local people wanted to change in the 1980s that's fine if there was genuine local pressure and as i say more than only 20 percent of people wanted it changed then there is more of a reason to change it than this road name Furthermore, the term black boy historically has been used to be little black men. Pubs known as the black boy began to appear around the country about 350 years ago. I mean, pointing out that black boy and calling someone a black boy is, uh, can be said to be a racial slur, that is fair enough to say. Though it is quite annoying he's going through all this before we go through theories of what the pub could actually be named for. Because as we say, if it was named in the late 16th century, the King Charles II nickname is a good contender, but as we say, maybe it is just named after a literal black person. There are strong associations connecting this name to the slave trade, for example this black servant depicted in Tottenham in the 1675 painting. Now this is the biggest issue I have with this particular TikTok. He claims that there is connotations relating to the slave trade, and then in his example he has a painting with a black servant. Now. Just to get into the nitty gritty details, a servant is not a slave. A servant, by definition, is paid for their services and is free outside of their hours of service and does not suffer bondage like a slave does. So it is very disingenuous to say there are links to the slave trade here and then in your example not have anything relating to the slave trade. And yet, if you're a kid just watching this on TikTok and your attention span's not very good, you will hear connotations to do with the slave trade and just take that as word. And then they'll say, oh, but you had an example, though. Well, we've gone through the example in detail. It's a very bad example. It doesn't actually show what he's trying to say there. So TikTok Zoomers are going to take that and go, oh, the black boy's racist then, when it wasn't. And we've not even got into the more likely theories here. But there are also other suggestions, including reference to King Charles II being known as the black boy due to his French ancestry. 
boom, finally. Hey, this has racial connotations. Hey, it might have something to do with slavery. Hey, this is really bad. Oh, by the way, it might just be a completely innocent name that we're blowing way out of proportion, by the way. By this point, most Zoomers will have gone to the next TikTok video with the first information he's put in anyway. This is something that The Guardian does a lot. If there is someone they don't like, they will say, this person is bad because they have been to court, but they won't actually go into detail and say, this person went into court as a witness and has absolutely nothing to do with the crime someone else has been accused of. That is something that The Guardian has done many times, and this is essentially what this TikTok is doing. The black boy is a racist name, doesn't matter about the rest of the details, but I'll put them in there anyway, and then I can say, hey, I'm just giving all everyone the information they want. It's a very underhanded tactic, and it's very annoying. And this is a tactic I simply cannot bring myself to partake in. The new road name La Rose Lane is coined after John La Rose, who in 66 founded New Beacon Books in North London, the first specialist Caribbean publishing company in Britain which still stands today. Cool, once again, just a little bit of a tidbit fact at the end to end the TikTok. But again, pushing that the connotations of this pub were all racist, when in reality they are probably far more innocent. And then mentioning in a quick five seconds how it could actually be innocent, it's, it's not a good way to try and deliver information. But hey, it's a lot better than you actually get from the BBC at least. Having said all that, absolutely ridiculous situation we are in. And the... <laughs> whole system, the education system, the university system, all that, they are going to push more people who are going to be for these things when they come out to the real world. And they are going to be in for a shock when all this window dressing comes tumbling down because the underlying ideology simply doesn't work and will end in ruin. And then these people are going to have to learn to code, but hey, we'll get that to that problem when we get to the post-clown decade. Uh, I don't have a name for that yet, but I don't know how good things are going to get in that decade, so it's probably one we're going to have to name in 2050 if I'm still doing this. I hope I'm still doing this, I do really enjoy it. But anyway, that's everything I had for you today. So as usual, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.